Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andres. I'm also very honored to be here. I uh, did not expect uh, such a well-planned and uh, attended event. Um, I'm honored to present some of the ongoing research we are doing at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and particularly the City Form Lab, which I run. Uh, and I will focus uh, largely on our current investigations on Singapore, but trying to tie this into a broader context of research in the area of urban design. Um, so my talk is titled Capturing Urban Intensity, uh, but it refers a lot to fundamental and important questions of livability and good urban design um, in the case of Singapore and internationally. And if you think of density, uh, one can always imagine two sides to density. On the one hand, there's the negatives of density. You have to share more space with people. You have to share uh, a subway car. There's friction, congestion, etc. And in different fields of research and study, there are actually quite good and well-developed ways of quantifying these negative aspects of density. And people cite them fairly often in literature. But density also has very positive aspects to it. Density produces very uh, unique and uh, special types of activities in cities. It produces museums that um, are not able to exist in small cities because they, they require a large um, audience like modern art museums. It produces commerce and activity. If we look at a very simple urban economic model um, and use an example of a few households, um, I have two cases here on uh, the upper example and the lower example. They have exactly the same amount of houses. And the inputs to this model are transportation costs, uh, the cost of a particular service, uh, frequency of visits for that service, and the distance between stores, then simply keeping other factors constant by moving buildings closer to each other, the economic models predict that uh, patronage at stores or service providers would go up because people manage to shift more of their budget from spending it on transportation to actually the goods, so they can go more often. So this model holds very well in reality if we look at the, if we plot the uh, retailers per square kilometer and population per square kilometer um, in American cities, we get a very nice correlation. So denser cities produce more um, uh, economic activity and uh, diversity. Uh, so this is as a back backdrop. Um, the motivations for our investigations in Singapore, uh, and in especially in the case of this talk, are threefold. Um, we think that it's very important to be able to describe these positive as aspects of density and intensity uh, as well, at least as well as we can describe the negative aspects. And so far, we are um, not as developed as uh, uh, transportation researchers in capturing the negative aspects. Uh, second, uh, we as urban designers and physical planners uh, need to develop a better understanding of how urban design, the physical interventions in cities, in fact, change or impact these uh, activity distributions and uh, softer qualities of urban environments. In other words, we need to get a better understanding how physical configuration impacts um, activity uh, distributions. And third, uh, um, beyond that understanding, we need to be able to put that into our project and very much like um, Case was showing some of their wonderful work uh, in Europe around the world. Uh, amongst architects and urban designers, the sort of mainstream view of this is that everybody agrees that urban design matters, but the uh, idea that we can somehow capture it uh, in some more precise ways is uh, very much controversial. In the words of Alison, uh, Alison and Peter Smith and Miss Smithson in England, uh, what they call the charged void is this uh, uh, activated and loaded urban space. Uh, uh, the charged void describes architecture's capacity to change the space around it with energy, which can join up with other energies, define the nature of things that might come, anticipate happenings, a capacity we can feel and act on, but cannot necessar necessarily describe or record. Part of our work is to investigate whether we can actually describe and record and get a little bit more precise about it than um, uh, just discussing um, how we feel about an area, et cetera. If we can actually quantify and describe the good qualities of dense urban environments. Uh, here's an example of a famous plaza design, designed by Victor Gruen in Connecticut, uh, in Hartford, uh, which uh, from day one uh, was a very popular project and widely publicized, but never really attracted the kind of use that it was meant to in the images. 
And here's a, uh, the, almost the opposite, um, uh, a very uh, popular and widely used uh, square in the, down, uh, in the center of Rotterdam designed by West 8. And we think that a basic understanding of configurational analysis uh, can explain um, the functionalities of these two examples. In order to do this, uh, we move towards an empirical approach. We, we basically uh, very carefully and systematically try to investigate existing urban places and untangle the complex realities of how they function, um, put multiple factors together beyond urban form, but also look at the economic issues, traffic issues, environmental issues, and social questions, and try to see what role urban design plays in affecting life in such urban areas. Um, empirical approaches in urban design um, have not been in the mainstream for the last several decades. In fact, we learn much more about designing new places than we do about analyzing how existing places actually work. And we think that this is a very important area of investigation today uh, to untangle these complex issues. Um, there's some work um, historically around this. Uh, people mainly um, in Europe and US, starting from uh, Robert Park in Chicago and all the way to uh, the Smithson and the Brocken and others uh, who've looked into this. Um, the general critique towards urban design has been, uh, and in the words of uh, Jane Jacobs most famously, that uh, design is basically based on poor evidence, uh, as she critiqued her, um, uh, the New York of her day in the 1960s, and uh, argued that design alone can do fairly little to improve urban areas, that it has to come in combination and coordination with other important things like institutional support, economic support, and uh, social considerations. Um, Urban design, in that sense, has, has been critiqued to be reductive um, and reductionist and simplifying. And we know uh, uh, very important examples from the 20th century where large moves and large gestures in urban design have resulted in uh, much inferior uh, outcomes than actually promised and, and, and foreseen. And this is a, a, a general condition um, in many parts of the world, uh, there's a strong contrast between what is uh, sort of officially and centrally planned and designed, and then the kind of life that takes over uh, when people are left to actually adapt, uh, control, impact the environment on their own. Uh, this, this idea that um, uh, architecture's role and urban planning's role should not be 100% control and uh, planning over the future of an environment, but rather something that's more open-ended and open to change, uh, has been nicely uh, uh, described by John Weeks in England as this analogy of a duffel coat. I put this t-shirt in here because I don't know if everybody knows what a duffel coat is in the tropical climate of Singapore, but the idea is the same. Uh, the idea of urban design being a little loose not too tight, not too exact to your body, uh, but something that allows you to uh, change your position, move your body, and wear it in different um, settings and different uh, conditions. Um, the, the idea is that urban design, too, should allow that kind of movement and not be over-optimized to perform exactly the one function that it needs to perform, but allow the people who use it to change it to some degree and rather perform as a framework than a precise solution. Um, 